Welcome. This is the December 21st Beehive Call. We have Rod G, Chuck T, Jan B, Andrew H, Katya, Chris M, and myself, Michael. And we've been just uh, talking back and forth, but it sounds like Chris has been doing some research on state handling in Beehive. Chris, what have you learned in your research? Well, um, what have I learned? Um, obviously, <laughs> You could probably argue it's a lot bigger than I had anticipated, but um, I'm at a state where I'm I'm in front of a couple of questions that I would like to share with you and hear your opinion and take on that. And for that, I put something into the PRD, which I am just now really quickly looking up the link for you to share in the chat. Hold uh, on a I second. may have the tab here. Is this the one? Uh, yes, that's it. Okay. And if you scroll down there in the, somewhere in the end, uh, at okay. the end, it's down, 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 further down, further down. It's really, it's, <laughs> as I said before, I have to cut this. I have to start cutting things. Here we are, state handling. Here we oh, are, here hello. we are, here we are. Um, yeah, so, um, basically, um, I'm wondering what, what, I mean, is there a right approach? I, I really don't know. Um, I, I know that Jan has, um, has has some work started for a kernel module, which kind of has the benefits of having state, whether there is a daemon running or not. Um, but if we were to have just a user space daemon, then obviously there would be a potential issue that if the daemon stops, but to do with the VMs, either you lose the state or you have to shut down um, for, I don't know, for, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, let, let me just quickly run through my thoughts, Jan, and then I would, I'd lo I would love to hear your opinion, okay? Um, and so I kind of compiled this diagram also in the bottom here to better understand what kind of states might probably be useful uh, when uh, looking at a VM. And again, I understand that this is very much also probably applicable for jails, but I figured because Beehive apparently really is kind of easier uh, in terms of what kind of states and problems might occur. So I, um, I, I, I focused on that. And one of the questions that I started with was also, would there be any kind of benefit in separating potential problem states that occur during a restart or a reboot, or are they just really identical to a shutdown or a failure, if, if, if you catch my drift? And, um, and the second thing that I'm wondering is, and I think this comes out here at the bottom part, uh, where you see, I don't know, I called it network start and network stop and storage start and storage stop just to kind of highlight that obviously there seem, or there needs to be some kind of inverse functionality of what took place during the setup phase so that the teardown is equal and clean in terms of no matter what happens. And what I got confused during my work was how much expectation would one put on the user to write book scripts that are uh, basically atomic. Because if, if, if any kind of hook state, a hook script changes the system state and, and then a failure happens um, during that script, basically you end up again with exactly the same situation that this kind of state handling is supposed to resolve, but really doesn't if if, if, if the user doesn't adhere to some kind of um, rule set or, or guiding uh, guiding rules, does that make sense? Can, can you follow what when I'm trying yes. to, um, to paint here? Okay. Um, but uh, continue, please continue on less uh, questions because otherwise yeah so probably the, 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 the question if, if you scroll back up i think i had the questions basically can um, you uh, zoom out a bit so that we can see more uh michael uh definitely just um, and just go Chris, to your audio is a touch robotic was it okay 
Does it start at design or higher? Uh, no, it starts with state handling. Uh, it's just oh. really state handling. State handling. Look, look. Down, down, down. Oh, so down, down. Okay. Yeah. Uh, here, 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 here it is. State handling. Yeah. That's yes. it. Um, so that that those are really the questions that I'm that I'm having. You know. Um, um, all right. So where does this where does it start? Where does it end? You know. Um, do we do we have two different kinds of failures? Is a running failure different from a stopping failure? I don't know. And um, and again, how do how how do you um, how would you expect the user to handle any kind of system changes in 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 hook scripts, let's say, or or, or modifications that take place during those transitions, maybe? Um, and um, and would that would it be better to have something that has basically all these kind of concepts of storage and network integrated because then basically any kind of setup that one would usually put into a script is just you know done done by that by that demon or whatever whatever is managing the state how far does that really extend you know, that's what i'm wondering so um I don't think you're um, overfitting the problem uh, because okay. uh, Beehive isn't so much of a special case uh, as this suggests. It's a fairly simple process to manage and supervise on its own. The complexity is the generic part, which is in no way Beehive specific, which is modular, reliable uh, service management. And that is something which Beehive specific hooks don't really solve. And well, there's no nothing to be gained from basically just adding additional code to make f uh, additional code to make whatever mechanism you're imagining uh, less useful because you are adding complexity to do prevent it from being uh, general enough to be useful for other things if you do the state machine you're putting down there. You, um, so instead uh, you can get away with a, a lot simpler approach. Basically you have two kinds of services, namely uh, scripts mostly you execute to completion uh, in the expectation that you care about the side effect they leave behind. Things like creating a network interface or uh, connecting uh, uh, to a specific iSCSI target or something or uh, to making a ZVOL uh, available in some device file system or something. Um, and here, uh, just like in normal programming, the the guideline is that a partial constructor, so if you, for example, create a new tab interface but fail to rename it uh, because for some reason the name uh, cannot be used, maybe it's there's a race condition, someone else took it, or um, the name for other reasons is blocked, then um, you have to undo your partial setup. And constructors just must not fail. They can basically fail at their task, but you can't handle an error to in an error. So if you if you create an interface, uh, uh, fail to rename it, and then fail to destroy it, there's not not much more you can be expected to do, given the APIs available to you in this case. So you can only really fail catast catastrophically and just stop, don't even restart, just give up, say, this is broken. I'm in some kind of locked maintenance mode. A human has to look at this. Uh, or a higher level tool has to really decide that it's okay to ignore this error. But you, at this point, you have to give up and, for example, uh, leak the, let's say so you create a, tap interface and someone else comes along and moves it over into a different VNet. 
and then you want to rename it and you get the error that the interface you've just created is gone. And then you try to destroy it and find out that you can't even destroy it. At that point, yeah, you can only give up. As in, unless you have a um, general purpose AI, <laughs> your use, neither your user nor any kind of uh, shared service uh, can handle this. This is just, yeah, you did something wrong. Um, that's the problem here. Root can, can fuck uh, himself up. So yeah, that's about the state of it. Jan, what about Beehive operating as a, a process with all the setup in place? For example, is a that's panic not... operationally different from other stops so and such? What kind of panic Simple do you faults? mean? I... Uh, so if you have an internal error, yeah. Beehive already encodes that as uh, an exit code unlike, yeah, unlike yeah. any of the normal ones. So if you look at the... It's pretty far down in the man page. There's a decoding table telling you what each exit code means. Yeah, it's a triple yeah. arrow. Exit code four. Yeah. If I remember correctly, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, right. Chris, so can, Chris, uh, your your audio has gone robotic. You might have to either. Okay, I'm gonna rejoin. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, I mean, it's 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 let me check what the exact uh, mapping, but um. So zero is the guest uh, performed the reboot. Um, one is guest requested a power off. Uh, two is guest uh, halted. Three is a triple fault in the guest. And four is any other error internal to Beehive. And anything even higher is also a undocumented crash. So uh, the thing is, unless you want to support some kind of warm start where you preserve the device and memory content, which is very pro problematic to do, um, if you encounter the, any kind of shutdown for any reason, be it a kernel panic in the guest uh, without a halt or a reboot or a shutdown, you always want to basically tear down the whole guest. So stop the beehive process, destroy the VMM device, and then recreate a new clean one instead of restarting with a potentially corrupted uh, vid.io uh, device emulation state where you're in some kind of invalid state and you have to do an additional recovery, which may not even be possible depending on what kind of device you're talking about. Or maybe, yeah. A problem. So just clean up completely and restart if you want to start. You, you don't have to tell the these fine points apart. You only have to record them in the logging uh, output. But it doesn't really matter if uh, the guest um, performed a clean reboot or uh, died with a triple fault or kernel panic or whatever, because for well, the hypervisor, it's the same task to do unless it has been configured to not auto reboot uh, on a triple fault or something. But that's more of a policy question than a mechanism question. And this uh, here, basically the design, Chris proposed a uh, hard codes policy, uh, uh, this, state machine is uh, implemented somewhere in a privileged uh, context where you're forced to go through these states. Uh, so yeah, exactly. you, you, everything is good enough to basically expect your um, one-shot scripts you're running to completion uh, to either uh, be happy with their result or undo their setup and destructors do a best effort at cleaning up. And because hopefully everyone is a bit mindful of uh, destructors being uh, unable to uh, recover from errors uh, and that tear down is kind of resource release instead of allocation. So you can eat some error states. So for example, if you want to destroy a tab interface and it doesn't exist, 
you can just uh, emit a warning and say, yeah, but I found I was instructed to destroy a tab interface, but I found there was nothing to destroy. My work is done. I shut down successfully because uh, there is no longer uh, a tab interface uh, of this name. But if you find an interface with the name uh, you want to destroy, but it's not in the group tab, then you treat that as a fatal error because uh, it's better to barely stop running than uh, destroy another interface. Because let's say someone did a copy and paste error and uh, put in the primary nick or uh, the bridge interface where all the guests are attached. And now you do an IF config bridge zero destroy and suddenly <laughs> you made everything 10 times worse. So it's okay for a destructor, so basically a down shutdown script to um, do some validation before it just cleans up and then, yeah, fatally fail to make the state transition. And then the state machine gets stuck and you have to unstick it manually. Um, but uh, that's basically the point where you have to admit that uh, some errors require intervention or um, code which just eats the error, uh, hopefully at least locks it and uh, consumes the error um, and then succeeds at its task despite the error. So, and then the other kind of service you have to support is the long running supervised uh, process and it's easier if you restrict that process to have to stay in the foreground and not demonize itself, which is one of the few things we can truly thank systemd for because they made it common to do that. Uh, this has been used by DJB daemon tools and the like since the late 90s, but uh, it was still an uncommon configuration and oftentimes logging to standard out and error um, and staying in the foreground was restricted to some kind of uh, debug or verbose mode with unintended side effects. And these days it's just so common that it's almost universally supported to not demonize and log to standard error or standard out, which is what Beehive already does just by accident because it doesn't do anything, uh, which is a good thing in this regard. So yeah. And then you need some uh, way to have uh, dependencies between these services. And it should be enough to just have uh, groups, which includes groups of groups. And um, yeah, that's about it. And every service can be, if you're not restricted to uh, be backward compatible to uh, sequential systems like FreeBSD RC scripts, you can uh, execute any uh, operation as soon as its dependencies are met. And that's exactly how S6RC works. So, yeah. Chris, uh, does that help clarify? Um, I things? linked in the chat to uh, S6RC's FAQ page, which explains why uh, it's a uh, problematic design choice to have intermediate states like starting or um, they even failed uh, because it, from the point of the service manager, yeah, what does it mean? And if you restart a, a starting job, for example, what, is this, what does that semantically mean? Is it really, it's neither up nor down, so what is it? And then you get into well, overly complex uh, state machines with behavior which is not um, universally useful or, and which, in my opinion, aren't more powerful than just um, multiple of the simpler state machines uh, held together by uh, grouping if you need it. Just have two two simple state machines uh, interact with each other instead of one big one, in this case.
Previous so instead of having uh, special states for bringing up networking and storage and so on, you have a group of all the dependencies. And if you want something to be available, you add it to this group. Hmm. So um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, there, there's absolutely a case for abstracting, you know, and mm -hmm. making things so generic that basically you can sort of build your own. I'm just wondering how much abstraction is too much, because again, I think one of the mm -hmm. issues that I, at least I, the way I understand it is that people are facing the situation. I mean, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. I think it, there is almost all the tooling already in base to be able to kind of supervise a beehive process because you can use daemon. I mean, if you really Not want really. to. Yeah, we've covered that. But remind us, Jan, what the shortcomings of daemon were. Uh, the da okay. daemon command is intentionally very limited. Um, it does not uh, allow basically a reliable way to signal the child process uh, or to get its exit status. So um, the problem is it can okay. only unconditionally restart the child until it, through a signal, is instructed to die itself and then take its child with it. So Damon the gets the process. signal, not the child process? Yeah. Damon forwards some signals, but you have no real control over that. Do you know if it would forward don't you get the, the, don't you get the child? Hmm? Sorry. Go ahead. I'm just curious, in, in our case, would it forward the ACPI shutdown kill or not? Um, yes, but it would also die itself, I think, because if you send it as sick in... Oh, because that's term, a kill. That's a kill. Uh, okay. that, no, not a kill. It's okay. a, a sick int or sick term. I okay. think both of them lead to the same behavior in Beehive, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the, what then happens is that it will in, forward the signal and uh, stop itself. Okay. Which is not what you want. You want yeah. the supervisor to stay around and to restart the supervised service. Yeah. And you potentially want then it to not just restart a single process, but restart the guest, which means in reverse order, tear down all the state. So stop the beehive process, destroy the network interfaces, make the storage unavailable and so on. So undo uh, all of the setup unique to a specific beehive guest. Uh, for example, in S6RC, you would express that by putting all of that into a bundle and then you would uh, just do an S6RC uh, dash D uh, change and then name of a bundle and that would stop all services which are a member a member of this bundle of services and that while observing the dependency ordering so a service would not be stopped while there's a service depending on it and if you stop a service with dependencies through the state transition logic it will first stop everything depending on the service you're shutting down so basically it computes the transitive hull and does the shutdown in opposite order of startup, which is exactly what you want. And it's enough. And because you need that for the special case too, the special case logic is strictly uh, less powerful and more complex than the generic case because it doesn't get you anything, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And you're not saving the user from anything if you expect them to fill out lots of... Uh, different types of hooks instead of having fewer types of hooks. Um, what uh, you actually, need instead is the it, semantic interface where you're not saying run with shell script, but you need some uh, either a command which is the, so easy to use that it becomes uh, basically the syntax to do it. So something like make these devices available to this beehive uh, jail or something. Uh, or um, you um, kind of need a front end to take a bit of configuration and then basically compile it down to the simple state machine. Mm. So you may need 
one more layer of uh, abstraction instead of a single layer of not abstraction. <laughs> and I'm guessing you don't want to tear down everything for be it a simple restart. You well, mentioned... what depends on what well, you mean uh, by everything. Yeah. Uh, for example, yeah, the, 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 the idea, the idea here, or my thought, were really um, not about you know um, asking the user to create hook scripts for all those states. Exactly. It's just um, basically having having nodes where people can put scripts in when when they actually want to run mm -hmm. something in that particular state. Um, what what I was uh, also wondering before is you know how much abstraction is uh, too much and how much is enough, because what I wanted to point out is um, clearly there is tooling available to to um, to go as big or as small as you like. At the moment already, but um, I think one of the one of the challenges that people are facing that that everyone is kind of um, kind of spinning their own thing, and w w I mean I don't have the answer. It's and I think you, we all have the same question: Where is the point that uh, the sweet spot between the abstraction and the non-abstraction, where things become easy enough that people are willing to run with the same defaults let's say and 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 not start spinning their own so um i'm a friend of having very easy to use uh, hook mechanisms so that it doesn't feel like writing a script but you're basically just putting in a single invocation of a command with a syntax which is close enough to the mental model the user tries to manipulate that it does not uh, produce too much of a basically mental load for the operator to use uh, and configure and which should still be also easy enough to target with the next layer of abstraction if you want one, but it must be usable without it. So... It isn't hard if you need 10 other services uh, to uh, to manage it. At some point, you have to say, this has to be good enough on its own to be useful. But it also should, shouldn't should be too restrictive to build on top of. Chris, do you yet have code implementing any proofs of concept or is it still sort of a, a research i have some code but it's it's not it's not in a vulnerable state it's just you know it's code tied together with a bunch of uh test cases okay but it's it, it should probably be very straightforward very easy to uh, build it to something that can run and that um that i can demo but Again, um, I'm I'm with Jan on that. You know, um, I don't I don't think that this is the perfect approach. What I what I have what I have here, it's just um, it helped me better understand the problem space. That's that's what I can say. And that's it's very true. valuable, fortunately. It is, and I've been in the same place you are. I've written lots of complicated state machines and read about it and put them on whiteboards put them in note-taking applications and try to think through it and found out that this is really not helpful to make it that complex. All these intermediate states and cases really fall apart. And it's normally if you have this divergence in place where, yeah, this shouldn't be one state machine, but multiple ones, the single service, the interface between the service manager and the service should not be too uh, rich because then every service has to be integrated with it and you get something like macOS LaunchD with its uh, different varieties of service uh, um, activation and socket activation and transactions within applications. So basically, suddenly, if you want to delegate the resource management to the to launch D so that it shuts down seldom used services after a while automatically. Services then have to uh, enter a transaction whenever they don't want to be shut down automatically. 
for resource reasons and so on. And that means that now basically every application even has to be integrated with, and that's not something I see with FreeBSD project being able to maintain. Okay, that said, <laughs> do you feel specifically for Beehive that there is there are missing hooks in Beehive itself for that interaction with proper supervision, or is it all adequately there? Um, it's in my opinion all adequately there. Okay. What what isn't uh necessary but would be nice to have and just nice to have and trivial to implement would be to implement the s6rc readiness uh, protocol where you just tell it when you're basically ready uh, write a single new line byte to a file descriptor and close the file descriptor which is a pipe and that's good enough to signal that yeah the service is now really ready. So basically, I'm about to execute the first guest instruction. Hmm. Um, what I did so far is I just um, hold for the um, tab interface to uh, be opened. Uh, or if I wanted a more, uh, more um, semantically relevant definition of readiness, I would wait for the IP address to be pingable or something like that. So when the, if the guest responds to ping, the VM is ready. And of course, these kinds of readiness, uh, if you want really the response to ping, you have to poll, which is something you don't want to force on uh, users to resort to polling. It should be possible and easy if you want to, because you need something as rich, but the basics should work with uh, notifications, not with polling. Um, yeah. So you do have your own, You, as I understand it, you've been working on network setup and teardown and device renaming and folk I've can find the latest gist of that. Much. Uh, I'm, I've looked at the, what it takes to basically implement an idempotent uh, helper script in shell to uh, around IF config for things like creating and renaming interfaces and handling all the handle, uh, the possible partial failures along the way and to recover from recoverable race conditions. So for example, if I run the same command at the yep. twice uh, and create the two dynamically allocated tab interfaces, one can take the intended name, the other files, it then destroys its uh, temporary interface and then checks, is there an interface with the name I wanted to create and is that interface a member of yep. the group yep. tab? And then it's happy, emits a warning, but uh, and still succeeds because the desired state has uh, been uh, reached. And that's the inter the way I see this being tooling friendly and uh, user friendly as well. So that you have item potent commands similar to Ansible module behavior, where if I run it twice, it will just say, yeah, my job was already done. I didn't have to change anything. And uh, if you run it the first time, uh, it will say, yeah, I was successful and I had, and I changed something. Yep. yep. Okay, so uh, from, the, if from you, yesterday's call, you are looking at using, I guess, without Netlink? Uh, no, I, um, for the interface stuff, I'm using Netlink. I'm using Netlink, okay. Um, because, um, yeah, the FreeBSD Netlink implementation is intentionally Linux compatible for the things which can be compatible. So these parts are thereby as frozen from a, API and ABI level as Netlink is on Linux. So that means that FreeBSD implicitly has accepted the same ABI constraints. So yeah, this is easier That's to stable. target for a user land tool, which is not in base. In base, it wouldn't matter, but the IOctals can change and have changed between releases in incompatible okay, ways. Okay, so for example, okay. IF config from a very old FreeBSD or 
system or from a 32-bit user land and a 64-bit user land, some networking commands yes. which use the struct layout directly will not work with the IOctal interface, but because NetMap serializes everything okay. into messages, it still works. But it works and they've stabilized the interface. Great. So you mentioned multiple state machines. Is that your your item potent script simply a a component in the mix and we need a separate state machine for networking on top of that? Or so the idea would be oh. in this case uh, for Beehive. Yeah. Um the command line interface I want to implement yes, works sir. like this. You have one command which is basically similar. Think of it like an alternative to IF config if it ever gets comp really done. But um, the, the behavior is that it, um, you, you say the state you want some part of the system to be in, and it will tell you that this state has been reached. If, if doing, for example, the one of the commands will be clone interface. And you give it the name of the interface you want to have, and optionally the cloner it should be cloned from. And then, um, if it's successful, there will be an interface from cl cloned from this cloner by this name. If it cloned a new dynamically allocated interface and then fails to rename it, uh, it undoes its interface creation, but not the whole network configuration. And one of the things to make it easier to use in uh, such service managers is that you can uh, basically chain one a uh, multiple subcommands behind each other. So, for example, I could say something along the lines of, I want there to be a bridge named bridge zero. I want there to be a tab interface named tab VM zero or VM my guest or something. I want this tab interface to be a member of this bridge. I want the bridge to be up. Uh, and then you start Beehive. So Jan, can and you, can you describe the... how you see this as different than what Chris is proposing? Because to me, they sound like very similar things. They are close, but the, the devil is in the details. Uh, because what I see in uh, Chris's design is a special purpose, overly specific state machine, which is just an annoyance if you need anything unexpected. It's similar to, for example, the existing uh, hooks in the jail command where if there's a hook missing in one place, you're just out of luck and you have to fight the tooling because uh, it's not flexible enough, but it would be simpler to just turn some of the functionality into a little helper command, put its libexec directory or something in the path, and then make it so that you can just have multiple simpler commands run in succession instead of this restrictive state machine. And why is it done that way? Because the existing sh commands you could invoke from a shell script are too annoying and fragile to use. So in U we get special purpose wrappers. And yeah. And the special purpose wrappers are strictly less powerful. They're only easier to use if you don't want to exceed their intended flexibility. So um, Jan, yeah. do you picture that being useful outside of Beehive? Like, what the, uh, the alternative interface to the IOctals and Netlink? Yes, of course, it would be useful for example, for VNet enabled jails or yeah. um, just, uh, or for example, if you have a VPN software, which has to update the network stack, uh, for example, if you have a wire guard uh, up-down hook or something and stuff you want to do there, um, there are lots of places or even a DHCP client script or something where you want to uh, have some hook script decode uh, 
um, some kind of unusual or very new or site local or something PHCP option. Okay, yeah, so you have you have our corner cases. You have a vision, you have our attention. Uh, how can we get either a design doc out of you or more code so that we can all coordinate? And for example, yep. Chris can aim at a part and say, ah, I see why that needs to happen. And here's a way to implement it. And let's go back and forth on just getting that done, just so we don't keep revisiting this for another few years. <laughs> yeah, you've succeeded in getting our attention, but let's let's break this down into actionable steps that we can all participate in. So you've mm -hmm. got the floor. <laughs> what can okay, you so what do I to guide us user on this want... and not duplicate effort? So what I would like to see is for the user to interface with a human-friendly uh, configuration file. Uh, the best uh, format I can think of for that is, uh, given the trade-offs, would be to use the in-base uh, libucl and maybe register a few Beehive-specific macros. That should be the human uh, interface to the configuration. And then you have to have a very easy-to-use command to uh, execute the configuration to would that uh, describe all your networking and storage? No. What would what would we, go in that config file? I do file? not want to uh, start that kind of bike shedding discussion. Oh well, then what? And alienate ninety percent of the FreeBSD okay. community. Then how by, is that uh, config file different from the Beehive raw VM config file that gets parsed? Mm, What's I've, unique? Okay, well, that config file would be um, different in such a way that it would describe. How do I have... UCL is a lot more powerful than most um, configuration languages, especially if you register your own macros. Among other things, it can slurp in uh, binary data yeah. into values okay. uh, from files, so that you could even uh, slurp in an executable uh, or a okay. script, and then you. And the other part is that it has very flexible include support to maintain modularity so that it's easy to template and thereby replace or overwrite um, subtrees of a configuration. Okay, so, that so you they're don't sitting have down to, to describe a VM or their entire like system or what? Yeah. But you instead put a, or replace a file's content and because of the location you placed it in, the include will find it and it will be merged in the whole configuration. Okay, so it's powerful. So what is one describing in that configuration file? A single VM, a complete network, or what? Um, the, the basics which we really need are um, the access, how which block storage to make available and how to make it available. Okay. Um, and how to attach a virtual machine to the host network, and maybe and potentially also a device pass through. So basically, it's the function and all the other Beehive parameters which are already encodable in the current configuration format. Okay, so which and the naturally they are not aware of networking beyond like, hey, I'm requesting this and don't care how it appears. You would say something like. I need a bridge uh, by that name. And then some, some other part of a configuration could say, I want to be a member on that bridge, but it shouldn't require that a bridge be owned by it. If the host network stack is already configured to have this bridge, then it should be able to just take, make use of it. But to make it user-friendly, you should have to do that. You shouldn't have to go through all of the parts because the problem with FreeBSD is that there are so many powerful subsystems available to recombine into really interesting and useful configurations. Yeah. But the um, barrier to entry is too high and you shouldn't have to know that many things just to get started. This is very true. So let's, okay, we got to paint this picture. What does this 
how do we and make a framework of this to make it actionable for all of us and the participating idea would to participate? Be to, um, for flexibility purposes, to basically make it possible to, um, I would say, have a directory with sub with commands, which then basically consume its subtree of the configuration. And thereby you can, really, if you have a, this node in the global configuration, there must be a command in this somewhere in libxec in a subdirectory, which has the same name as this node in the configuration. And then this command gets executed. So if you want to extend the format, you just throw in the new command there. Okay. And that way you can extend it to your heart's content. Can you bless us throwing... with a design doc? Because you're addressing Not issues today. that you've <laughs> cl clarified. Can you map this out so that we can collectively assist and move forward with it? And at least personally, it's always easier for me to actually see things. So, for example, what I have done, uh, because we have a few new users here, um, yes. uh, I'm, I've used S6RC, uh, which is available for ports yep. and packages, yep. uh, to uh, supervise uh, Beehive and, for example, create the Z-Volts download. Correct. The, You've done own. amazing work. Can you <laughs> map it's it out for us? And... PL, it's own. But that's one possible configuration. Yep. And I did it with uh, Ansible, and the setup time to provision was like 10 minutes because it involved so many tiny little steps, and Ansible okay. is slow. Right. Uh, you could probably get it down to five seconds instead of five minutes. Great. Uh, if you write three or four Ansible modules so that it doesn't have to call out to a uh, trivial little yeah, module. Yeah, got it. Each. So can we... Yeah see that can we see the framework that that operates in can you have you documented that can mm. we can you squeeze just remove the your proprietary information and get us touching it because we're dependent on you in many ways to just guide this because yeah. you again you have our attention you you have addressed countless concerns <laughs> So give us something actionable. What can, how can we start the year off? Yeah, um, we're building this we'll out. Have to the... start off the new year. I can't do it uh, the next two weeks. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Fortunately, the... this is recorded to go through the concerns you've raised, Chris. I hope that's helpful. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to fault anyone for the sheer complexity of these systems that have developed over decades <laughs> so yeah we're all kind of touching different corners of the elephant trying to make sense of it so uh yeah uh so jan you've got our attention let's i i seriously i'd love you to give us a design doc because you you have mm -hmm. something in your head and hopefully with the holiday you can just belt it out because we're here to help and we have amazing resources yeah. at our disposal and very talented people and willingness, especially in the context of the Broadcom VMware acquisition to make this a really powerful, wonderful tool that's a, you know, capable and easily accessible. Take care, Chuck. Sounds like you got a drop. Um, duly noted that you might be able to assist with the save restore feature. Changing gears. Uh, Daniel, do you have any I don't know, real world topics to address insofar as production topics. And I know you brought a colleague, Katya, and welcome, Katya. Uh, nothing really. I've just been uh, I've, I've been playing around with uh, more than 16 CPUs to see how that affects and improves performance, boot times, stuff like that. I don't have any metrics. Uh, just, just, you know, just stuff I've been playing with. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing too exciting in this corner of the world. Do you, how, how high have you gone on that? Uh, I did, I did 32 just to see if it would crash and it didn't. 
and okay. uh, been running some r- real world uh, 20s. So, so not too much, but I don't have, like, I think the highest, yeah, the highest core count is 64. So I don't really have a ton of, a uh, ton of space to go much higher than that. It wouldn't be sensible to go any higher than the core count, obviously. So, right. um, yeah, I mean, what's the, what's the highest it can go? So Antonig had a rather massive, maybe 192 core system. And if you look in the minutes, I made him a small script to just start up and tear down a VM. And he found some interesting behavior as you, of course, grow in number. And if you alternate between even and odd numbers of vCPUs. So very few of us had have had any hardware to genuinely explore that uncharted territory there's you don't even have 192 threads anywhere there were some experiments michael that we did when i first redid the mac cpu to clean up the fact that the code was broken and wouldn't let you go very high yes sir we actually i believe we ran a we booted a 200 vcpu instance on like a 32 or 64 core machine and it actually can be done. It just becomes horrifically slow. Um, but you're exactly correct. Attempting to go beyond your current core count is not a good idea. And I don't know if it ever got enforced that it prevents you from going above your physical core count. Don't think so. It's not a bad idea. I mean, to have like a, you know, like a, like a warning message shooting a log when it, it sees a beehive start like that. Agreed. One of the but... things we are also missing is because if you want to basically have such a big system, let's say 256 at least logical CPUs on the host, um, and you want to have a good experience for the guests, you kind of want to pin the guests to uh, reduce the noisy neighbor problems. And what we are missing is a little helper command here, which uh, b- manages CPU sets so that you can then have Beehive pin the vCPU threads at least. Um, so that well, you don't have fully support upcode the CPU IDs uh, into the configuration, but can just say, I want to have four pinned. Uh, CPU cores, please uh, empty them of everything but Beehive and um, dedicate them to this guest, basically. Um, I've, I've experimented with that, but I found it uh, tedious to manage. I feel like there's there needs there would need to be some more tooling around around that. But I'd, I'd love it if there was a way to say, you know, give this sucker a dedicated. So you know, what you, dedicated CPUs in, in like VM Beehive or a tool like that. Yeah, yes, put that, it in the design doc. Don't make me tap the sign. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Map out those helpers, please. Is there a, uh, I know we're over two o'clock now, but I don't think there's you know there's sort of a plan. For, uh, for for Beehive, and I'm wondering if it would be, if it's in the cards or in the plan somewhere that the Beehive command, the Beehive command suite, can start to look like the Jail command suite. I feel like that that would be, and I know they are they are obviously many differences there. It just would be interesting if there could be parity because I would have the amount of training that anybody would need to run. Beehive in jail. I think they've been having some discussions on the jail side about doing something like that. Um, but I'm not being a ESD person. I'm not completely sure. Uh, I can so, tell you on the on the Solaris side of things, we do have a unified interface through our zones commands. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, I feel like zones is a solution to a lot of things. Would it would be a lot of solutions to a lot of things in the in the free BSD world. 
So Daniel, you can run Beehive in jails. Um, right. The I'm other talking, thing is I'm talking about just management, though. Like if the yeah. management looks similar, service the you know the uh, service mm -hmm. Beehive start or restart VM name, something like that. That that might be. I mean, obviously, a very long term goal, but I think that that would be a it is you know a goal. It's it not. can be done already. Through the just by the, the special purpose state machine uh, quiz uh, mapped out looks very similar and can probably be completely expressed using the jail.conf uh, syntax and the jail uh, command. And well, that's very interesting. So, what then uh, basically a beehive guest is just a special kind of jail. It's a uh, Exec hooks would be the setup and teardown. And the only change you may have to do if you want to avoid uh, additional um, basically process in the supervision uh, chain, uh, which decodes the exit state, you would have to make that the jail command forward the exit status through a jail uh, variable. Uh, so that you can, for a variable in the, the next hook, uh, exec, uh, access, sorry, not exec, access uh, the last hook's exit state. And then, yeah, maybe the signal number as well. And then you uh, have everything you need to just, that's probably a really tiny change to the jail command. Huh. Uh, yeah, that, that actually makes total sense. So... Beehive no, so... uh, guest is just a jail, um, and you happen to know that this jail uh, has the same name as a um, this guest. And yeah, the pre-start would uh, do make run the idempotent helper command I've mentioned, or a four hundred line shell script uh, to call, and that both works. It's just that one is very ugly. Um, so then you basically set up the host networking stack to be ready to receive a jailed beehive process. Yeah. So right. might we institutionally want to consider that a bit like zones does, a, a, and if they do it for good reason, they, they zone the virtual machines. How short a path is that from what we have today to that having enough boilerplate to get people up and running and not Burning the fingers. Um, if depends on how you opinionated you're prepared to make it. If you're prepared to make it very opinionated, it's a jail.conf in 14.0 to include per beehive guest. It's just a long uh, jail.conf array. How I wouldn't say spinning on your under your palm on your laptop, how far along is your code that you mentioned relating to? jailed vms is that how ready is that running okay but specific to a single uh, lab environment okay could you please sanitize it of personal information and get it out the, in front of us all you already I'd have be willing to, with... yeah i'd be willing to put in production for the problem least... is that uh it lacks abstraction uh, as in there is an abstraction, but to extend it and add a new feature, you have to understand so many concepts yeah. at the same time that the barrier to entry is too high for as it is for me to see that as a feasible tool to be useful to share. Of course you can, I, uh, I'm willing to share it, but, uh, at the same time, I don't see it as reasonable to expect others to pick it up as is. Well, as is, no, but in, in conjunction with your design doc and opinions and observations, let's get ourselves there. Um, so, I mean, the problem is that uh, we have how many current... decades of jail to leverage here? I don't know. Hmm. Uh, Katya, any observations? This is not our average call. We usually have reports on various things, occasionally a demo. I know Antrenik would like to demo some things. Any questions for the group based on this? 
Um, not for today. Not for today. Okay. This was a unique call. Um, Chris, um, I hope this is useful having set us down this path, but we're, we've been exploring this path in countless ways for months, if not years. Let's try to tighten this up and work on some deliverables. I have a meal on the table and should go, but I'm happy to let y'all talk amongst yourselves. Would you prefer continue okay. or uh, call it good for this week? It's been a pleasure, everybody. Happy holidays. I'll talk to you later. Cool. Take care, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Um, Rodney, I hope that's useful. And uh, shall I call it? Sounds good to me. Cool. So okay. Well, thank you, everyone. If anyone wants a code, just send me a message and I will throw it at you. And you can uh, uh, tear your own ha hairs out to your heart's content. Perfect. Go ahead and send that to Daniel and myself just to get us re back to that because I'm now under the gun to deploy yeah. something <laughs> and i yeah, want it to be have, um, from this century started cleaning it up and making it more approachable but then got sidetracked that's by, life uh, yeah could you put a link to the code in the minutes yeah when i make it available yes okay excellent okay. Everyone progress have, has been achieved everyone have a happy holiday and also happy and prosperous new year <laughs> excellent okay Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye.